the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. We're going to talk today about a major human rights crisis that has largely been hidden from the outside world. That's happening in the South Asian nation of Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. Their tens of thousands of Muslim Rohingya people have fled their homes after what's been described as a campaign of terror by Myanmar's security forces. About 70,000 have fled Myanmar's Rakhine state for neighboring Bangladesh, where they live in squalid refugee camps. Others have fled by boat to other countries in Asia. Survivors have told rights groups and journalists about how Myanmar's army and police forces entered villages and conducted summary executions, burned hundreds of houses, and gang-raped women and girls. Now, the UN's human rights arm has recently warned that the scale of the attack on civilians may amount to crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing. Now, the Rohingya are a religious minority as Muslims in mainly Buddhist Myanmar, and even before the recent attacks, they'd faced decades of repression. Though they've lived in Myanmar for generations, the government has denied them citizenship, and that's made the Rohingya the largest group of stateless people in the world. Now, a Myanmar state-run newspaper even recently described them as fleas, who are, quote, loathed for their stench and for sucking our blood. Now, we'll hear more about the Myanmar government's role in the crisis from some experts in a moment. But first, we're going to talk to Patrick Wynn in Bangkok, Thailand. He's an Asia correspondent for Public Radio International. Uh, he's been to the Rohingya refugee camps in neighboring Bangladesh to cover the crisis. Patrick, welcome to Global Journalist. Thanks for having me. Well, you were just in these refugee camps on the Bangladesh side of the border with Myanmar. What, what are conditions like in those camps? Uh, the camps are pretty miserable. Um, they're very muddy places where uh, new arrivals show up with absolutely nothing but the clothes on their backs that they were wearing when they fled uh, Myanmar's army. And when you get there, uh, you know, you don't have any shelter. So I would see people um, in the perimeter of the camp just building uh, very crude structures out of mud and sticks so that they could have some place to live. And when I asked people how they felt about uh, having to do this, they said they they felt like they were making uh, pens fit for an animal, but now they have to live in them. And you spoke with a number of the refugees about their experiences. What were some of the stories that they told you about what happened to them back in Rakhine State? Uh, wow, where to start? Uh, murder, uh, the burning and looting of villages. Um, these, these crimes are fairly well documented in testimony from Rohingya that have fled to Bangladesh. But the crime that stuck, uh, that really stuck with me the most was uh, the systematic rape of not only women, but uh, teenage girls uh, in Rohingya villages. And in particular, I think you interviewed one girl named Fatima, and uh, you spoke about her in one of your reports. What was her story? Well, um, and, and that is a pseudonym to protect her identity, but this is a 13-year-old girl. Um, who had been violated in pretty much every way you can imagine by uh, Myanmar troops. Um, they came in, they torched her village, uh, they separated the men and the women of the village into two groups. Um, she fled when she saw this because she knew that something bad was going to happen, um, fled inside her home, and then three soldiers uh, came in after her, caught her, uh, stripped her naked, and raped her. Um, this happened in front of her mother. Um, she was very badly injured, but made her way to the camps in Bangladesh, um, where she was treated at a, a Doctors Without Borders camp. Um, I, that was not the only uh, young girl that I met with a story like that, and it certainly wasn't the only uh, uh, woman I met with a story like that. There are scores and scores and scores of women and girls um, with that story. I just happened to focus on, uh, on, on this particular tale. And this, I mean, the scale of the rapes that are happening makes it sound like it's almost a systematic policy by Myanmar's security forces. What, why, why do you think this is part of their strategy? Because when you talk to these women, and, and remember, it's not just me as a single person going into these camps. Uh, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the United Nations has gone into these camps and asked women what happened to them. And you hear things, from, this is from a United Nations report, they talked to several hundred people, and more than 40% say that they witnessed a rape. Uh, more than 60% said they witnessed a killing. Um, so this, these are not isolated incidences in, in the fog of war. This is uh, systematic in that 
these women have very similar stories. When the troops come in, they tend to uh, corral the women in a, a systematic way, and they tend to rape them in a systematic way. And in your reporting, you said that it appears that Myanmar's security forces, they almost have like a playbook for pushing the Rohingya out of the country. Tell us about that. Sure, yeah. Uh, this is what usually happens. They go into a village and then they accuse the village of um, aiding or even sympathizing with uh, extremists, Muslim extremists. Okay, so once they've established that, then they sort of run amok. Usually what happens next is uh, homes get torched, okay, so people are starting to panic. Then they uh, corral the men and the women into two different groups. The men will, may get beaten, some may get killed on the female side. Uh, the soldiers then pick the ones that they fancy and they rape them either in homes or in a jungle clearing. Um, sometimes women are killed after they're raped. And um, then one other step is, of course, they loot the place of what very little these, these people have. They're, these are in sort of people living in swampy, impoverished areas. They don't have much, much at all. So this isn't just, uh, they're not just doing this for fun. There's a purpose behind this. And it seems to be that they're trying to purge these villages. This is, this is textbook ethnic cleansing. They want them to leave. They want them to flee the country. And many of our listeners will recall that Myanmar was run by a military junta for years. And then there were elections a couple of years ago, and Aung San Suu Kyi, the Nobel laureate and democracy activist, uh, her party won. She became sort of the de facto president of Myanmar. Um, and now her party kind of shares power with the military, I understand. What, what did she said about these atrocities? Um, you know, she's been largely dismissive. Yeah, I, I would remind everyone Aung San Suu Kyi is probably the most famous person from Myanmar ever to have lived and a key U.S. ally. Um, she has a reputation as a defender of the meek. You know, that's why she's mentioned alongside, alongside uh, people like Nelson Mandela. Um, so you would expect um, a, a more um, empathetic response from her. But um, she has accused the media of exaggerating stories like the ones that I've uh, been telling. Um, and offices under her control have gone even farther. They've accused women of ma making up rapes. They've even used the phrase uh, fake news, uh, the Trumpian <laughs> phrase fake news, to uh, imply that the international media has some sort of uh, insidious agenda and is fabricating stories. And Patrick, our time goes short, but I also wanted to ask you about the response of Bangladesh's government, where many of these refugees are. What has the response been from them? Is Bangladesh okay with hosting these people, or are they trying to get rid of them as well? Yeah, very briefly, no, Bangladesh does not like this, you know, tsunami of, um, of refugees pouring into their country. Um, they don't want them either. And so the most recent proposal that I've heard floated is to move them all to this sort of half-sunken island out in the ocean. I think that gives you an indication of um, how little Bangladesh uh, wants to deal with this problem as well. Patrick Wins, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. A reminder that you're listening to Global Journalist. We're talking today about the plight of the Muslim Rohingya people of Myanmar, the country formerly known as Burma. Tens of thousands of Rohingya have fled their homes since October after Myanmar's army and security forces began a campaign against them that the UN's human rights arm says may be tantamount to ethnic cleansing. We're going to bring in some other people who have been following the situation closely. Uh, joining us from London is Chow Win. He's the executive director of the Burma Human Rights Network. And in Bangkok is Phil Robertson. He's the deputy director of the Asia Division of Human Rights Watch. Also joining us, uh, joining us again in Seattle, Washington, is Michael Thurston. He was formerly chief of mission at the U.S. Embassy in Myanmar from 2011 to 2012. Welcome to all of you. Phil Robertson, let me start with you. There has been this long history of persecution of the Rohingya, but why did the government sort of launch this massive campaign against them back a few months ago? Well, what happened on October 9th was... A, an insurgent group that had not really previously been heard of uh, attacked several border guard posts. Uh, they killed nine personnel. They made off with over 60 weapons. 
uh, this uh, caught the government of Myanmar, the security forces, uh, completely unawares. And what we saw immediately within day, uh, within hours of this happening was a retaliation, a move by the government forces to go into some of the Rohingya villages, uh, ostensibly to seek these people and to start the kind of violence that Patrick Wynn mentioned. Uh, we're talking about rounding up the, the residents, looting, uh, raping women, killing men, and ultimately torching uh, entire villages. And so the response sounds enormously disproportionate to the initial attack that I guess was sort of the pretext for, for this campaign. That's correct. And that is the fundamental problem. No one disputes the right of the Burmese government to pursue the people who committed this attack. And, uh, you know, if this had been essentially a uh, professionally run search, a, a proportionate response, that would have been one thing. But what we saw instead was short for tactics that uh, extended from uh, the few areas uh, near the border guard camps and, and moved from east to west over the course of a, of a month and ultimately resulted in over 1,500 structures being burned down. And this is information that Human Rights Watch was able to document by satellite, using satellite imagery, because no one was being allowed into those areas. The humanitarian groups, the UN agencies were all blocked. The security operation area was completely off limits. And, you know, the military forces uh, were able to do what they wanted to do with impunity in those areas. And, and you know, when we brought out the information, we brought out these satellite images, actually uh, officials in the government disputed that they said that you know not that many villages had burned down and they had flown over with a helicopter and in some of these areas and they try to count the number of places that were burned down and you know i think the international community started to realize that we're going to see a pattern of uh denial deflection uh by the burmese government dealing with these issues well let me turn this to chow win in london then if you would, give us just a little bit of background about the Rohingya issue. How is it that people who have been living in Myanmar for generations aren't considered citizens, can't vote, can't sort of take part in public life? So first of all, I would like to thank you that uh, for asking me this question. But the reason is here, um, the historical background of the Rohingya population is very strong. And that is undeniable. I mean, they have been existing those that, that land since generations, several centuries. And there are so many historical evidences exist. But the government, what the Burmese governments and the Burmese are doing is, they are blanketly uh, denying all the evidences and they are putting them into the category that they are illegal immigrants. So they, if you look at the uh, citizenship system, citizenship law in Burma, 1982 citizenship law, which is uh, which is uh, one of the main criteria that in order to establish, uh, to become a, a citizen, citizens of Burma, or to become a, a ethnic of Burma, your ancestors must be existing in Burma before uh, the first um, Eng uh, Anglo-Burmese uh, war, which is uh, 1823 something. So in in that in that, this is a very rare case, a very strange law. You know, this is not international standard. Uh, uh, citizenship law that exists in Burma, which is which uh, denying the the right of the Rohingya populations, and Rohingya peoples are living in the centuries in in Burma. If you look at the historical background, there are eleven kings who use Muslim names and who print uh, the, the the coins in Islamic. And and yet, in spite of all this history, they're still considered illegal immigrants. You said, and it sounds like this law from the 1980s was used to specifically disenfranchise them. Well, let me let me turn this to Michael Thurston now, because you were in Myanmar during sort of the last sp big spasm of ethnic violence there in 2012. What happened then? Can you tell us just a bit about that and what the response of the government was? Well, what happened was um, the rumors went around that someone, a, a woman, was pulled off a bus and attacked and raped by Rohingya males, men or something. It was some sort of rumors that went around. The next thing you know, the community, the Buddhist uh, Rakhine community, rose up, started attacking uh, the, uh, the villages, the Rohingya 
villages. And our problem was trying to get the government and lo- that along with local police and, and border was to get, uh, army was to get the lo- uh, the national government to step in, intervene and separate the groups and protect the Rohingya. They were very slow to do so. Um, it got very nasty very quickly. And I think that at that point it was what we found was it was we weren't prepared to respond to it. We hadn't been uh, prepared for this kind of uh, problem. We just we were so focused on trying to move a democratic Burma forward that we did not look at some of these other issues, uh, including the the, the uh, Rohingya in the Rakhine area, which had been going on for a great great many years. In 1938, the British formed a commission to look at Rakhine. Uh, Rohingya immigration into that region and to try to address some of the issues that were starting to go go on uh, back in 1938. But of course, the onset of the war prevented them from moving forward with that. And so this is a conflict that has been going on for decades. But let me turn this to you, Phil Robertson, uh, because we heard Patrick Wynn talking about uh, his his the stories that he heard of women and girls who had been raped by Myanmar's army, by its border guards, and sort of a systematic attempt to terrorize the population. What has Human Rights Watch learned about this? What have your own investigations shown? Our investigations are consistent what, with what Patrick was talking about. We found cases of women and girls being raped. Often after the military force came into a village or an area, there were separation of men and women, and uh, women then taken away and, and raped. We also found that uh, there was a systematic sort of uh, searches uh, of women uh, for valuables. They thought that, you know, this was also a, a bit of a looting party by the military going into these areas and searching for valuables uh, that women might be hiding in various parts of their body. And so uh, even for the women who were not raped, there there was also a very crude, um, you know, in some cases overtly sexual uh, searches taking place. And, you know, in response to this, we have seen a just wave after wave of denial by the government of Burma. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they are just not accepting that any of this has taken place. And we just saw yesterday another round of denials by uh, the chief of staff of the Burmese military, who gave a long press conference essentially denying that there were any human rights abuses that had taken place in northern Rakhine State during these times. You know, it's simply not credible. Uh, we also had a case where uh, some, the case of two women who were uh, accused of basically falsifying their rapes. We uh, actually uh, interviewed them in Bangladesh and determined that they were rape victims. What had happened is they had been interviewed by journalists in their village. Uh, then the village chief told them that they had to come and appear before the military and the police to tell their story. And they were so scared they ran away. And that was used by the government to claim that this was a fake rape case and this was a case being used to discredit the security forces of Burma. And I should say that we did invite representatives of the Myanmar embassy in the U.S. to join our program. They did not respond to that request. In the meantime, I want to remind you that you are listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. We're talking today about the hidden human rights crisis in the South Asian nation of Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. We're joined by Chow Win of the Burma Human Rights Network, Phil Robertson of Human Rights Watch, and Michael Thurston, a U.S. diplomat who previously was U.S. Chief of Mission at the Embassy in Myanmar. For more Global Journalists, you can visit our website, globaljournalist.org. There you'll find our ongoing coverage of underreported international news and human rights issues. That includes a recent photo essay about Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. You can also check out Global Journalist on Facebook or Twitter, or subscribe to the video cast of this program on YouTube. And Chao Win, I understand that there was recently a letter to the UN Security Council about this issue signed by 13 Nobel laureates, including Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the Pakistani women's rights activist Malala Yousafzai. And it says that in this letter, these other Nobel Peace Prize winners say that they are frustrated with Aung San Suu Kyi's silence on this issue and what's taking place. What what are we to make of that? What what more could Aung San Suu Kyi, what, what could she be doing? Yeah, from my point of view, um, I agree that uh, these novelists, uh, you know, what they're expecting. And, and in the international community, 
everyone expecting her to do something for the Rohingya community rather than uh, keeping silent. But first of all, I would like to tell you, we need to understand um, the, 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 system, the system of government in Burma. There are two entities who control Burma, who rule Burma. Yeah? One entity is uh, very strong, the army, and another entity is the Burmese government, the NLD government, which recently elected. They are not that strong as as we as they're supposed to as a government. If you look at the constitutions, uh, according to 2000, 2008 constitution, um, the three key uh, ministries are under the military control: Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Border Affairs, and Ministry of Home Affairs. It means all the security sectors controlled by the military. So the government they cannot implement any kind of rule of law unless the military concrete. And when the, this military itself, they are committing crimes. So government has a very weak position. And so, so, so she has no direct control over the military, over the security forces that are thought to be committing these. And yet she also, but she, it's not like she's powerless. Yes, but one thing is she's not that powerless. I mean, she has a certain power. She can, she can do some things and still she's not doing. She choose, one, one thing is very sad that she choose to conceal the crime of the military by giving the false uh, false uh, idea to, to international community that military is following the rule of law and they abide by the rule of law, actually, which is not. We have we conducted several uh, investigations and interviews in uh, Bangladesh border, where the several uh, hundreds of uh, victims who <laughs> ran away from the from uh, northern Rakhine state and they shelter there. And when what we found is Something's gruesome happening in in, in in those areas, and the military they they have a, you know they have a free to kill license. Whenever they enter any village, they just kill anyone they they see, and they rape any woman they want, and they loot it. They destroy the food stocks, and they destroy the houses, and they created mayhem, big big chaos, and that push all the people to force these people to run away from that villages. So it is. Uh, cleansing. I mean, people, they are clearing those areas, those locations, and we need to see, we should also see that, um, what are they going to do with these places, because they are now uh, clearing all those villages from the Rohingya population. There is no population that remain there. And they, they're destroying all the villages and houses and, and uh, berry fields and, you know, livestock. So it means uh, for a human being, it is not possible to remain that place. Well, let me, let me turn this to Michael Thurston then, because we did hear Chow Wen and earlier Patrick Wen talking about some criticism of Aung San Suu Kyi. I understand what, that while you were in Myanmar, you had a fairly close working relationship with her. What do you make of her response on this issue or, or lack of response? I think in part she's responding to the reality that she doesn't control the military. And the military does control the border region and, and border security. And that's a reality she has to deal with. That, that does not absolve her from uh, the necessity of taking a position in which she tries to support the rule of law in that region and ask the military to do the right thing. But it's difficult for her because she has to walk, walk that line. She needs their support to stay in power. And she needs their support uh, so that democracy can try to move forward. And it has a long ways to go there. We're not where it needs to be. I think one of the things people forget and are surprised in her response is that she's Burmese. And I think some would argue that perhaps she's a Burmese nationalist. And while she does not, I don't believe she supports in any way any abuse, uh, human rights abuses, she's not going to uh, alienate herself from her base, her support, which is Burmese. And I think she's, she's very attentive to that. And, I think behind and, the scenes. And so in other words, then, is, is there there's sort of political support then for at least restrictions on the Rohingya then, it sounds like? I, I don't think I could go that far to say that there's support, political support, or at least her support uh, for restrictions on the Rohingya. Look, there are supporters of her, some of the younger generation uh, of leadership that have come out and have spoken out and have demanded that the government and the military respond to the rule of law in those regions and address human rights uh, abuses in that region. Um, she has not done so, but I think I understand where she's coming from. And I think sometimes we need to understand she's not necessarily who we want her to be. She has her long history. She is Burmese. 
And she's very proud of that. She's very cognizant of that. She's her father's daughter. She believes it's her place to be at the top and to follow on from his, his leadership was cut short. He was assassinated. But we, we forget her background and who she is. I don't think in any way she supports human rights abuse in that region, but she's going to walk a very, very fine line uh, in terms of alienating, alienating the military. She cannot afford to alienate them uh, any more than they may already be. They don't particularly like her. The mili- That's one thing I found out very clearly. military does not like her. Well, let me turn this to yeah, Phil Robertson then, because how I wanted to ask you, how would you rate the response of the U.S., its allies, the international community to this issue? The scale of the human rights abuses that are taking place is really quite, quite large. So are we seeing effective response? So far, we're not. Uh, of course, we're working on trying to turn that around. Uh, we have the Human Rights Council, which is going to be meeting. It's actually meeting in Geneva now. It will hear on the 13th from the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Myanmar, Yang Hee Lee, uh, who will be calling for a commission of inquiry to be appointed by the Human Rights Council to investigate what has taken place in Rakhine State, to look at not only the violence that's taken place in 2012 and more recently last year um, going forward to now, but also look at uh, the discrimination and policy law and practice that takes place there. That deals with citizenship, deals with freedom of movement, uh, deals with restrictions on uh, rights to basic services like health care, education, all these things which are being largely denied by, uh, to the Rohingya. And so the international community has a test in front of it. Are they going to do the right thing? Uh, the European Union is uh, the uh, entity that has the pen, that they're the ones who are going to write the resolution. And we're working very hard to try to persuade them that now is the time to take this on. Well, let me let me just turn is, that to, to Kiao Win very quickly, because we did have a question via Twitter uh, from Jamila Hanan, who wants to know, how can the military be stopped from trying to eliminate the Rohingya people? What levers are there, given this hybrid system of government and sort of the ineffective response? First of all, let me very quickly tell about, talk about the Ansonsuji last time I left, I left the talk. Because there is a moral issue, this is a moral duty for everyone to speak up for the most persecuted people uh, in, in Rakhine State, I mean, the people for Rohingya people. She cannot go away with it because she has some political uh, bindings, political uh, restrictions. So that's one I want to respond to. But for the military, because they are the real culprit of Burma, those who are committing genocide or crime against humanity or ethnic cleansing everywhere in Burma, in Kachin State, in Shan State, in Rakhine State, in Korean State, everywhere. They, this military must be stopped. I mean, they are the part of the. They are not the sol- part of the solution. They are the part of the problem. They are the main part of the problem. So to address this issue, we must keep the international community must have very strong response. That's going to have to do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Patrick Wynn, Phil Robertson, Chow Wynn, and Michael Thurston for joining us. Our assistant producers this week are Lauren Donovan, Idom Kasaye, and Dewey Sim, with lead producer Rachel Foster Gimble. Alyssa Blyle is our visual director with multimedia producer Jonah McCown. Pat Akers of KBIA is our audio engineer. Travis McMillan is director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.